Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. Shall we pray? Father, what a joy to come into your presence this morning. Lord, we want to thank you for making it possible for us to come and worship you and to share fellowship with one another. I just pray, Lord, that you help us today and give us a fulfilled time in your presence in the name of Jesus. And Lord, as we share from your word, I just pray, Lord, that your word will work transformation in our lives in the name of Jesus. I just pray, Lord, that you hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Let me be your oracle and your oracle alone this morning to minister life to your people in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, and take all the glory. In Jesus' name, we are praying. How many of us know our team for the month? Our team for the month. If you know, you just wave to me. Our team for the month is a lifestyle of what? Faithful stewardship. A lifestyle of faithful stewardship. Amen. And this morning, um, to open a teaching session on faithful stewardship, I'll be sharing on the topic, the rudiments of Christian stewardship. What I'm going to do today is part one. Next Sunday, I'll do part two of this and run this through. I kept thinking that perhaps I should do a quick overview and run through everything. And maybe during Bible studies, we can dig deep. My dilemma was so strong that I had to just pray that, Father, leave me on this. And um, what came to my mind was, look, all this quick, quick stuff, you need to avoid it. Let's do something that is a bit in-depth that will deliver value. Though I know that we live in an era of quick this, quick that, quick fix, quick. I remember when I was going to the business school to start my MBA. During one of my trips at the airport, I found a book titled Pocket MBA. Very small book like this. So I quickly grabbed it. I said, ah, this will solve the MBA problem for me. So when I started the program, I knew that that was a deception because it didn't take me anywhere. And talking about quick this, quick that reminds me of a parish priest who had a horse and he was so used to that horse and, you know, he looked after the horse so well. And then one day, one of his parishioners came to him and said, look, Priest, I would want to ride on your horse. Can I? The priest said, well, you know, the horse doesn't know you. It, it, it will take you a bit of time to adjust. You may not be able to ride it immediately. He said, no, 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 no. Just tell me the commands. Give me the commands for go or move. Then give me the command for move fast. Then give me the command for stop. Once you give me all those three commands, then I'm fine. The priest said, are you sure? He said, yes. He said, okay. Once you get on the horse, you want the horse to move, just say, praise the Lord. Now, when you want the horse to move fast, then you just shout, hallelujah. And when you want the horse to stop, you say, amen. The guy said, oh, you mean it's so simple? And why did he say I can't? Oh, Look, I'm gone. He got on the horse, got on the saddle, and said, Praise the Lord. And the horse took off. Bang, 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 bang. He was enjoying it. Then later he said, Hallelujah. So the horse started moving very fast. So he was going. And then he saw that, look, there was a cliff ahead. He forgot the stop command. 
He racked his brain trying to remember the stop command. He would and the horse just kept going. And the horse soon stopped. He was so scared and frightened. And then he started praying. He said, Father, you need to help me. I'm in trouble. Father, help me. When he finished his prayer, he said, Amen. And then the horse just stopped by the cliff. Let's quickly turn our Bibles to Matthew 25. And I want to read from verse 14. The parable of the talents. And I'm reading from the New International Version. I'll read from verse 14 through to 30. Fairly long passage, so... I just crave your indulgence. It says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey Verse 16, the man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled, settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Verse 26. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Praise the Lord. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, and I'll read verses. Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. So then, men ought 
to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Praise the Lord. Stewardship is so important to us as Christians. But the reality is we seldom talk about stewardship. We don't talk much about stewardship. And that impacts on our performance as stewards that have been entrusted with God's resources. Christian stewardship is so critical for us as Christians. And that's why this month, and perhaps next month, by the grace of God, we will be focusing on this subject. And we're trusting and believing God that by the time we're through, we would have a very good understanding of the subject of Christian stewardship. But beyond understanding of the concept, is for us to be able to embrace the lifestyle of Christian stewardship. I recall in 1996, I was on the island of Maui, and we had this session on the need for us to be able to sit back, spend time to pray, and under God, come up with your life personal mission statement. And that struck the chord with me. And I took it very seriously. And I started praying. And I said, God, I want to know what is my life personal mission statement. Many of you are familiar with businesses. You come into their premises. You see their mission statement, right? I wanted to know, so what is my personal life mission statement? And after a while thinking through, I was able to come up with what is my life personal mission statement. And my life personal mission statement is to excel in my spiritual, family, and career life and to motivate others to excel in these areas of their life and to be a good steward at all times and in respect of all things entrusted to me. And once I was able to articulate this since 1997, the Lord has helped me to keep faith with it. I'm still working at it, but it guides me it defines what I do. It tells me, it helps me to be able to order my priorities. So matters of stewardship are core for me. The need for me to excel in my spiritual life, in my family life, in my career, is equally important. So my priorities are ordered. And to be able to motivate others to excel in this area. But again, it makes stewardship a very important thing for me. So as we go in and we look at the rudiments of stewardship, under rudiments of stewardship, we'll be focusing a lot of attention on the fundamentals of stewardship. And then we'll look at some key principles of stewardship. In this segment, I will look at who is a steward, and then I will look at the fundamentals of stewardship, and in part two, I will address some key principles of stewardship. Who is a steward? I'm sure many of us are familiar with this word, this phrase, steward. Biblically, a steward is a person who has the responsibility of managing resources that have been entrusted to him or her by God. 
And if you listen to that carefully, and you also have it on your outline, it says a steward is a person who has a responsibility of managing resources that have been entrusted to him or her by the master. Now, resources will cover a whole wide range of issues. In the course of our time together, both during service and Bible study, we will be looking at different areas of stewardship. It covers a whole lot. Stewardship of even your life. Your life is what God has entrusted to you. Stewardship of money. Stewardship of possession. Stewardship of talents that we've been endowed with. Stewardship of gifts, spiritual gifts, and so on. So we we'll look at all of those. So we we'll look at our definition today of stewardship. A number of things come to the fore. One is the fact that as stewards, we have been entrusted with something. Maybe skills that you have. Maybe gifts. God has entrusted you. The time that he has allotted to you here on earth is a trust that he has given to you. The money that you have is given to you on trust. Those that you have responsibility for, if you are a leader, is a trust. So, trust is core to stewardship. It's important for us to recognize and realize that as stewards, we've been entrusted with those resources. And once you've been entrusted with something, it's important to know that you have what I call guided management responsibilities and I say guided because you need to know that if you hold these things in trust there are basic terms that guide how you use the things that have been entrusted to you so it means that if God has entrusted perhaps you have a different way you want him to do the work so, as stewards, it's important that we go back and consult with the master to know what the master and how the master wants us to manage what he has entrusted to us. And then another key thing we need to remember is that when you are a steward, you are responsible to the person that has given you the trust. As stewards, we are responsible to the master. And simply, that means that as stewards, we must be accountable. What did I say? We must be what? Accountable. We must be accountable. We must account to the master. And I know that this is not easy. This is, this can be challenging. Because many of us don't like to account. Many of us don't want to be accountable. Yet, this is very, very key to our stewardship. We must be willing and ready to account. Accountability is very, very important to stewardship. I remember in 1997, I was away in Winnipeg attending the com a conference of um, Canadian um, Christian charities. And one of the CEOs of one of the Christian ministries in that country ran the syndicate group on accountability. And I sat under his teaching. And I will remain eternally grateful for what he shared. Basically, all he shared was about himself. And he said to us, he said, look, what he has done 
is to plant accountability checks on himself. So he said, in different areas, he has people that he has given authority to, to question him, to demand accountability from him. And any time they call, he's under an obligation to account. And he said, in the office where he's CEO, he has someone that nobody knows. And he told that guy, he said, look, in my position as CEO, any decision I take, that you have doubts as to why I took that decision, please feel free. Come and meet me. I promise you that I have a responsibility and duty to explain myself and to account to you. And then he said he got someone else who he gave the responsibility to as his spiritual check. And he said to him, any day of the week, please feel free to call me and ask me if I have read my Bible and had my quiet time on any particular day. And then demand what I studied. He said, and that guy was very faithful with that assignment because he doesn't know when the guy will call him. And that kept him on his toes to make sure that, look, he doesn't joke with his quiet time. And then he said, he had another guy who will call him anytime he travels during that trip to ask him, what is he watching in the hotel? You know, and then he said on his finances, he accounts to his wife. Anything he spends, anything he gets, he will come to the wife and he would account to her. I took it, I came back, I got my own accountability checks as well. That I can account to. And can ask me to account. I tell you, it's not easy, particularly when you start. But I think it's very, very beneficial. Very, very beneficial. Even if you think you've done something wrong, say it. The beauty of it is that if you do something wrong and you blow whistle on yourself, you know, it shuts down the devil. Otherwise, the devil will be telling you to hide it. Don't talk about it so that you don't look little in the presence of someone else. And then you continue to build on that until the devil would use it to destroy yourself. You blow whistle on yourself. Account. Even if you have made a mistake. Even if you have sinned. You know, on my finances, I account to my wife. Anytime I receive money or spend, I tell her, thank God she doesn't query me. And that helps me. Perhaps if she was querying me, I would be wary. The only time I receive query is school fees. It's priority. Have you paid your tithe? And even in my office, even before I took in partners, I made sure I was accountable. I won't take the practice money except what is due to me. So when I brought in partners into the firm, it wasn't difficult to be able to account. So, accountability is so key, and we need to cultivate it. If we want to build a lifestyle of stewardship, then it's important to cultivate accountability as well. And it helps if you have accountability checks. And sometimes, your accountability checks can also provide mentoring support for you. And their counsel can come very, very helpful. I have an accountability check and uh, mentor. Some of you already know him, David Wong. And I sit with him from time to time to talk. And I've come to value the counsel that he gives me. Sometimes I make my mistakes. And I just tell him I run through everything when I meet him. And he tells me, Peter, in this area, 
you are doing well. This area, I think you are not doing well. You need to improve in this area. I think you are losing sight of this. And they have proved very, very helpful. Some other time, I will share um, an experience around that. So, those are key elements. And we must always remember that was, we are agents of the master. So, we don't just go on our own frolic. We don't just do things the way we want to. It's important to know that we are agents. And as I think of stewardship, you know, one of the key reasons why I think we are all stewards is because we have issues with ownership. And that takes me into the fundamentals into the fundamentals. And the very first fundamental here is recognizing the fact that God is the creator and is also the source of all resources. Now, I say this, and then you say, yes, of course, we know God is the creator. But can I have a volunteer? Can a volunteer, preferably a guy, who would volunteer? Okay, Pastor Oken. Do you have any money in your pocket? You have money? Okay, I thought Sister Temi was the custodian. Praise God that you have some money. So, bring the money out. Let's see. Wow, okay. Bring, pull it out. So, who owns this money? <laughs> so, okay. He says God has entrusted it to Kemi and I. So, when you are going to spend this money, are you going to ask God? He said probably not. Okay, thank you. But, but you see, that is our reality. This hits the core. And that core centers around ownership. During our Bible study, I'll go deep into this and I'll trace the entire concept of ownership over time. The reality is, you see, we have the ownership mindset. We have the ownership paradigm. And once you have the ownership paradigm, it's difficult for you to release. Because anything that we have, you know, and it starts from even as kids. When the baby holds his or her toy, and you want to take it from the baby, what would the baby do? Eh? The baby will cry. The baby will pull it back. It's mine. It's mine. And then sometimes when you see two babies together, they are fighting over what? Maybe a toy. You see, very bitter struggle. One baby will say, it's mine, it's mine. She wants to have it. You know, and then you grow up, you grow up, you grow up like that, and everything around you, you feel a sense of ownership. Even between husband and wife, you come to the altar, you take a vow that, you know, everything you want belongs to you. But when the chips are down, what's happening? Eh? Yeah. So you see people always, one fight or the other, over ownership. Nations go to war over what? Ownership. It's a huge thing. You know, and that's why sometimes when you look at Leviticus, and you look at some of the laws, the commands that guide the people of Israel, the Lord tried to use that to correct some of these things. And that's why when it comes to land, there are all kinds of rules around it. So ownership is one thing that we need to get right. And it calls for a serious paradigm shift. We need, to, we, we need a shift. Our perspective and paradigm must change. So that we, this sense of ownership can relax. So we begin to truly recognize who owns this. 
So when Brother Peter Oken comes out and brings out his money, and I say, who owns this? And he says, well, God owns it. He didn't even say God owns it directly. He said, well, God has entrusted it to him. And But essentially, is God owns it. And if God owns it, it means that, look, God can call to use that money the way he wants to. And any time he wants to use that money, it's important for him to seek clarification and be sure that that's what God wants. Now, it's not just about money. It's also about your life. So if God says, look, leave what you are doing. I have another work for you. I want you to go into it. You don't, you don't argue. You just do what? You obey. Because who owns you? Eh? God. So if he calls you into an area of service, you don't start giving excuses. All you do is you obey. Because when the master calls, you obey. You don't own it. And there are several scriptures in the Bible to remind us that yes, God owns, he is both the creator and he owns every resource. We see the account of creation in Genesis chapter 1. How God created the heaven and the earth, created us. And then in Romans 11, 36, it says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. All things. And Deuteronomy 8, 18 reminds us that it is God that has given us the ability to even produce the wealth. He is the source. He remains the source. And in Joshua 25, verse 13, he had to, Joshua had to remind the people of Israel. The Lord had to say, he said, so I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities you did not build, and you live in them, and eat from vineyard, and olive groves, that you did not plant. And in Job 41, 11, the Lord had to say, he said, look, who has a claim against me that I must pay? He then goes on to say, everything under heaven belongs to who? To God. He says, it belongs to me. Everything belongs to me. Psalm 50 reminds us too. He says, look, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. The earth belongs to him. It belongs to him. It belongs to him. So we must always remember this. That God is the owner. He owns you. Everything that, has, that you have in your custody is entrusted to you by God. And you have a responsibility. And we need to come to terms with this as we seek to build a lifestyle of faithful stewardship. So recognizing and accepting God as the sole creator, the ultimate source of all resources, the owner of everything is at the soul of Christian stewardship. And it's not just that God is the owner. The reality is that God intends to retain ownership. He doesn't want to share ownership with you. He wants to retain that ownership. You are only a steward. You are a caretaker. You are a servant. You are only a custodian. But God wants to retain ownership. Psalm 24 Verse 1 tells us that, look, the earth is a loss and the fullness thereof. So God intends to and actually continues to retain the ownership of all that he has created, notwithstanding his decision to entrust some of these resources to man. The earth is a loss and everything in it, the world, 
and all who live in it. Are you part of that? Are you part of that? As long as you live here, the Lord owns you. And I tell people, and I say to them, for us who are Christians and have been born again, God has double ownership over us. He has ownership over us by creation. He has ownership over us by redemption. So God has double ownership. So if you had any doubts before as to God's ownership of you and everything that he has entrusted to you, I want you to remember that God has double ownership. Amen. And then God gives on trust. He only gives us on trust. And that is man's stewardship. God gave to man on trust to use and manage the resources he has created. And in Acts 17, verses 25 and 20, no, 24 and 25, he says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Everything else. Everything else. So, it's important for us to cross this ownership bar. It's important for us to make the shift from saying, oh, this belongs to me, I own this, to always remembering that you are only a steward. To always remind yourself that, look, this thing belongs to God. And then finally, our responsibilities as stewards. One is to recognize and continually accept God's ownership. We must always remind ourselves and we must always accept. Sometimes it can be a struggle, but we must always remind ourselves. And then discovering God's plan for the use of the resources entrusted to us. Sometimes we forget and we just go on using resources the way we like. Some of the resources the Lord has entrusted to us because he wants us to use them to edify the body of Christ. Some talent, some gift is given to us because he wants us to use it to serve others. But we may only be interested in using it to serve ourselves. So all you want to do, you want to be able to sweat those skills, sweat those assets so that you can keep things to yourself. Whereas God is saying, look, I gave you that so that you can serve other people. So that you can use it to bless other people. So that you can use it to serve. What talents do you have? What gifts do you have? What skills has the Lord endowed you with? What are you doing with those skills? Are you using them the way you like? Or are you using them the way the master will have you use them? Do you know God's plans for the resources that he has entrusted to you? Do you even bother to know? Do you seek to know? Do you obey even when you know the plans? Do you implement his own plan or you implement your own plan? Are you desirous of being a good and faithful steward? Or you don't give attention to these matters? There's going to be a day of reckoning. There's going to be a day that will stand before the master to give account. Just like those servants came before their master to give account. The first ma uh, servant who was given five talents came and said he made five more. And the master was so delighted with him and said, good and faithful servant, come into the master's rest. And the Lord is able to entrust a lot more to servants that are good 
and faithful. I pray that the Lord will find us good and faithful servants in Jesus' name. And then accountability. Accountability is so key. Because I see it a lot. It's a lot of struggle for many people to account. They don't like to account. They don't like to account to even bosses they see they don't want to account. Even children don't like to account to their parents. Some children don't want to account to their parents. Sometimes it's a struggle. When you give them money and say, hey, please, I want to account, they say, oh, okay. Struggle. But if we are stewards, we must account. Don't even wait for whoever your boss is or whoever, the, you know, whoever is giving you a trust to call you to account. You must willingly submit yourself to accountability. You must willingly submit yourself to accountability. It's so important. You know, it reminds me a story I was told, and I'll quickly share this as I round up. You know, one of our guys, he used to be the CEO of a private equity firm. And typically, they look for businesses that they invest in. And when they want to invest in you, they want to be sure that, you know, you have good standards of accountability. You have some measure of corporate governance. So he said, you know, this guy, they were working with him because they were going to invest in his business. And, you know, before now, he used to spend money anyhow. You know, you just call the accountant, give me this check. So these guys were now coming and they were putting in controls. And part of the control was that for there to be any withdrawal from the account of the company, there must be a process. You know, the... So, the man started. I reckon, so, maybe he was tired, and then one day he waited for the accountant to close. And then he went into the accountant's drawer, opened it, brought out the checkbook, and wrote a check for himself, and signed. And then cut it, and took it. And then the following day, the accountant came and said, Ah, sir, it's like somebody has taken one check leave from my checkbook. Ah, the man just pretended as if he didn't know what the accountant was saying. You know, and um, our friend who told us the story said sometimes some people can even steal from themselves. So accountability can be tough. But the beauty of it is the moment you submit yourself to it and you begin to practice it, in no time it becomes a way of life. It becomes a way of life. Even when you make mistakes, open it up. Nobody is going to kill you for telling the truth. Nobody is going to kill you for confessing to something you have done. I pray that the Lord will help us. And finally, the challenge for us as a roundup is to accept God's ownership and to come to terms with our own trust responsibilities and the need for us to internalize this and begin to reflect it in our every action to reflect it in our every action even in small things I know for many of us it will mean a major change it will call for a significant paradigm shift but that shift we must make if we are to become faithful stewards. Because it's only then that we begin to build a lifestyle of faithful stewardship. Let's bow our heads and pray. In the course of sharing, I said... God owns us. Do we have anyone here who has been struggling with God? You have never come to terms with the fact that God owns you. You think you own your own life. So you go about your life the way you like. And you have never at any time responded to God's call. 
that says you should give your life back to him. Have you gone on your own front leg thinking that, look, you owe no one account with respect to your life? Today, the Lord is making a call that you should give your life to him. So if we have anyone here who has not at any time decided to give his or her life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the beginning. That is where it starts from. You need to decide to give your life to Christ so that you can get on this journey of building a lifestyle of faithful stewardship. Is there anyone in the hall this morning who wants to give his or her life to Christ? Just signify by raising up your hand where you are. I will get someone to pray for you. You want to give your life to Christ? You want to ask Christ to come into your life? You want to ask Christ to take control of your life? You want to cease running your life on your own? You want Christ to take control of that life? Is there anyone in the house you want to give your life to Christ? Just signify by raising up your hands. And we'll get someone to pray with you. I want the rest of us to begin to talk to God. I want us to do a soul search. Are you struggling with God over ownership? Are there things in your life, resources, gifts, that the Lord has given to you? On trust? But over these years, you have operated it as if you own it without due regards to God's plans for those resources. This is the time to begin to talk to God and ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord to help you to make the shift. And let's ask the Lord to help us to become accountable. To become accountable to Him and to those that may be able to help us and put us on the path of accountability. Father, we just want to thank you. We want to magnify your name. Lord, you are the judge of the heart, and you see every heart here today. And Father, you see the desires of every heart. Lord, as many as are desiring, to make that important shift of surrendering and returning ownership to you of every resource they hold in trust, from their life to material resources, to skills, to gifts. I just pray, Lord, that you help them and give them grace to make that move and shift in the name of Jesus. And as they do it, Father, I pray that you grant them that sustaining grace to be able to remain faithful as stewards in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Take all the glory. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're just going straight into our Holy Communion service. Let us pray.